The Kilikani bog is a raised bog and it is the most important raised bog in the whole northeastern area. It's of paramount importance that it's re-wetted, restored and rejuvenated in light of climate change. The bog has been grown since the last ice age, over 10 to 12,000 years. After the melting of the ice, a large shallow lake was created, for example what we call the Kilikani bog as it's known today. The climate then being moist and cool, favoured the development of vegetation, form and pen, and as it became more solid bog, the moistness ensured a plenty of supply of water for its continued growth, and the cool temperature limited the rate of evaporation. The ground floor of the lake would have formed a chart like marl, and because of poor drainage, would also help to hold the water. Kilikuni Bog Project are a group of enthusiasts who want to promote the natural heritage of the bog and its surrounding habitat. Our aims are to give support to state agencies in their ongoing rejuvenation of this important natural ecosystem, both as an active carbon sink and of course a valuable flora and fauna habitat. Kilikani Bog, covering approximately 191 hectares, was one of the first bogs in the country designated a special area of conservation way back in 1997. The bog in the past was known by several names, many of which were attributed to the nearby townlands such as Kilikoni, Figat, Clopoli and Leitrim, with other names of the bog being the Big Bog, Mullabog and the Hedford Bog, as some of the bog was originally part of the old Hedford estate. It is important to preserve bogs as they are one of the world's oldest living natural ecosystems. They are part of each and everyone's heritage and importantly work silently as nature intended, along with all other wetlands throughout the world for the benefit of humanity. One of the important activities of this group is finding out what animals, birds and insects live in and around the bog. In the last two years we have started to record what species live here, having recorded the birds, bats, butterflies and moths. All of this is important as it is one of the ways we can judge how healthy the bog is. Bogs and wetlands such as Kilikoni are increasingly attractive to all of us in view of the fact that they are part of the great outdoors, free from noise and disturbance, and therefore very beneficial to the physical and mental well-being to users. A carbon sink can be more easily understood and related to in that it was demonstrated by a member of our group that Kilikoni Bog's present carbon content is approximately the equivalent carbon dioxide emissions from about 403,000 cars using Irish roads in a year. In the first instance, carbon is released if the turf is harvested, and secondly, more carbon is released once the turf is burned. We hope this film will achieve a better awareness amongst the public of the importance of these ecosystems and the preservation of them for future generations. The earliest known records from the sale of turf from the Kilikani bog dates back to 1851 to 1852 and it gives a detailed account how the Kilikani bog was so important to supplement the family income belonging to the Ball family. And we're very fortunate to have a written record from the 1st of May 1851 to 1852. And from a social history point of view, it provides fascinating detail of how the family lived four years after the big famine. I've been a member of uh, St Killian's Heritage Centre Trust and the Kilikani Bog project. In the past, a day in the bog was organised through the Heritage Centre and great support from the parish. Um, and it was a great opportunity to get across to the public the importance of preserving the Kilikani Bog for the benefit not only of the environment but general health as well. And having the day in the bog, it revived an old tradition of how the turf was cut by hand, a great interest to the public. The people that took part of the day in the bog uh, enjoyed telling their, their history of the days they spent cutting the turf on the bog. One member of the parish, Phil Gaynor, recalled the times the people spent on the bog during the Second World War, how important the bog was. There was no timber or coal in the country because of the war and the people were so dependent on the bog. People made small amounts of turf. He was saying that there was over 200 people working on the Kilikani bog to keep the, the furnaces going in the brick factory in Kingscourt. We were very lucky last year in that Birdwatch Ireland conducted a survey of birds in the bog and they found 45 species. Of particular interest are birds that are of conservation concern and that would be 
meadow pippet, skylark, kestrel, even the cuckoo that you'd regularly hear has been in decline and, and it's good to have it here. We're, we're lucky that the bog is a special area of conservation, so it's preserved. So any, all the efforts here to re-wet the bog, um, we, we know they're unlikely to be reversed. What's unique about the bog as a habitat is that it supports ground nesting birds. And these are the birds that have seen the biggest declines in their populations over the last 20, 30 years, mostly down to like modern farming methods. So we no longer have the wet bottoms, the grassland meadows that, that people would have associated with, with, with these kind of birds. So what you find here is that they are drawn to the bog in the summer because of the rich insect life. Uh, and even if you come here of a morning, you'll see clouds of insects as you walk the path. It gives you an indication of what's here. Why they're drawn to the bog is, is because of the rich insect life. They're typically only here for a few months of the summer. Even the birds that, that are, are residents don't stay here all year round because there isn't the food supply to support them. So from, we'll say, maybe March to September, this place is an oasis and then the birds slowly start to disappear. So, so typically this kind of habitat only supports a handful of birds. And the only thing that makes this different is that because of the borders, suddenly there's a lot of birds. But, but that's misleading. They have nothing to do with the bog. Okay. Do, you know, so we were talking this morning about the moth trap. As Jonathan was saying, if he puts it out there, he'll, get, he, he, he'll, he'll attract a certain amount of moths. But if he puts it nearer the trees, he'll get more. And, and that's kind of the, the, the distinction. Um, if you walk that path, it mightn't be that different like looking out in your own garden. Without this kind of habitat, birds like snipe, wouldn't have that many options of places to nest because of modern farming. We need refuges like this bog where they're, they're not gonna, the, the, no grass is gonna be cut, they won't be disturbed. Because it's so wet, there's very few ground predators that can disturb them. There's no cattle that's gonna trample the nest. Obviously, the grey crows or, or hooded crows that you, you will see when you're walking on the path are of concern. And it, it goes without saying that they would be predating some of the nests but it still doesn't seem to be affecting the breeding densities. Because as we saw from last year's survey, it's a very good density of pairs nesting on the bog. I think when you talk about birds being rare, you need to see in the context of, will I see this in my garden without having to put in much of an effort? You certainly won't see a snipe in your garden. So birds like snipe, meadow pipit and skylark are not common garden birds. So they are birds you will have to make an effort to visit somewhere to see them. Um, whether it's wet grassland, upland areas or the bog uh, and also the cuckoo. Well you, you can hear it on farmland, this is ideal habitat simply for the reason that one of its main host species is the meadow pipit and because there's such an abundance of meadow pipits here that in turn means you're going to have the cuckoo. Now is the best time and even like the last month, uh, we'll say probably from April to June because that's when you, you get such an abundance of birds and you'll be able to see the birds and especially the birds that nest in the bog, they're very visible at this time because they all do unique flight, uh, flight displays in order to mate. So if you walk along the path, you, you will see meadow pipits doing their parachute yeah. display flight. You'll see skylarks singing and rising. And you'll also see snipe if you're here in the morning. They do this unique thing where they can um, flick their, t their tail feathers and it makes a, a weird sound. <laughs> uh, if you come here um, early in the year, like January or February, or late in the year, as in like maybe October onwards, you'll be quite disappointed and you think that it's a dead place, but it's not, it's very much alive. Well, if you look at the bog, it just looks like a giant brown rotting sponge, but it's made up of a most incredible array of plants, most of whom have a very hard job to survive. The one that you see most often, which makes up most of the bog, is sphagnum moss. No flowers, but some lovely colors particularly noticeable in the autumn. And then on top of that, you have had several types of heather, which are very important for insect life. And also alongside of that, because it's a tough place to live, you have plants that eat animals, like little sundew, beautiful little plant, but it has sticky things on its leaves, which catch the insects, which have to be found in the bog. There's another plant which is, has beautiful yellow flowers and lives in the ponds and that underneath the water it has a little sort of sucker things, bladders that suck in insects. So the variety of plants is, is pretty astounding. 
None of them are like big tall trees with big leaves because it's a very exposed place so you, you don't want to be losing water so if you look at heather closely and I urge everybody to have a quick look at the leaves they're very small so that the water loss is, is minimal. So it's a, essentially an, an extraordinary story of survival and all this needs water to grow and that's what makes the sponge maybe up to 10 meters deep. Plants that are only found on the bog include, the, of course, the heathers, which are, are able to survive in these acid conditions, and also some of the, like the um, sundews, which uh, have to depend on trapping insects for their survival. So there's quite a few, and along the edges there's bog myrtle, and there's frockens, which are found elsewhere, but the frocken is a food plant for one of the most beautiful butterflies you get on the edge of bog, the green hair streak. We know that there's pretty good selection of butterflies and moths in and around the bog. So far we've uh, been walking up and down with a butterfly net uh, along the edges and have so far identified 15 different species of moths, which is not bad, it's nearly half Ireland's total. Special ones are the large heath, which is quite scarce and associated always with bogland or peatland, and also the green hair streak which feeds on the frock and the leaves of the frock and, and that you can see in May. If you see a green butterfly, it's heaven, it's, it's, it's beautiful. The moths, where are they today in the broad daylight? Nowhere, we can't see them. Last night we put out a, a light, a special light, which attracts the moths and we got, uh, well, nearly 20 moths, uh, about 10 different varieties, and we were able to identify them, we record them, and then we release them back into the bushes so that the birds, so the meadow pippets don't come around and find them and eat them. So we are slowly building up, and uh, we've got so far about 50 different species of moths, building up a database of what moths there are. And moths are widespread in many other habitats, but they're a good indication of the health of an area because they don't eat the plants, but it's their caterpillar, part of their life cycle, that feeds on the plants. And some of them are very specialized that to actually eat heather, which I wouldn't like to eat, uh, but, but so there's an interdependence all the time between the plants and the animals, the insects. The other organism that does like moths, which we've done a survey, uh, um, an expert, a bat expert, Tina Ockrey, did a survey last year and found seven different types of bats, and they'll be feeding on the moths, uh, and the caterpillars that come from the moths will be feeding on the heather, so there's a, a very important interconnected food chain. At the moment we are doing a number of surveys to see what the variety, the diversity of the plants and animals on the bog. Surveys have done of the plants and there's about 120 species, a good range of, for example, the sphagnum mosses, uh, but there are probably more to be found. Most of the mosses that have been found are typical of a, a bog, a raised bog, so that's good. The restoration of the bog, the wetting of the bog is absolutely vital. You may not like to walk in it so much when it all gets soggy, but that allows the sphagnum to grow and so the bog to grow. So the cutover part has become dry and you have this lovely um, hair's tail cotton growing on the cutover part, but actually that sort of will disappear as the bog becomes more natural, more wet, and the key is wetting. And there's been great work done so far as a result of the Living Bog Project to dam the outflow of water so it becomes more of a soggy sponge and the bog will then grow and capture more carbon as well, which is vital. Biodiversity in the bog is basically everything that grows here and all the web of life that's supported by it. So it goes the whole way from the mosses and the peat and all the insects and flying insects, ground insects, spiders, moths, butterflies, all into the, then the plants and the trees, even the trees that are surrounding the bog, the heathers, the mosses, and all the life that's supported by the ponds. To protect the bogs and the peatlands in Ireland and all over the world, we should really be getting away from using peat compost. So we should be looking, as gardeners, we should be looking, and horticulturists, we should be looking for peat-free compost for all our gardening needs. It's really important such a waste of our valuable resource, biodiversity resource and our carbon sink to be using peat as compost. Uh, the second thing we can do is to raise awareness for all sorts of people, intergenerational projects as well, just to uh, communicate the importance of the bogs and the peat for climate change. 
and to protect the bogs I suppose to raise awareness is key because it creates an awareness of the value of the bogs and the species that are on it and the peatlands for climate change. Killiconny is a special area of conservation since 1997. It's classed as that under the 1992 Habitats Directive. It's basically got protected status, so all of the species here are protected under that legislation. Peatlands are really important with regards to climate change. We are going to commission a study on Killiconny to measure the amount of carbon that is sequestered here in the bog, but uh, it's in the order of hundreds of thousands of tonnes. So it's really important that we conserve and protect our peatlands for our carbon capture. Uh, bogs contain more carbon than other forms of habitats like forestry. They're very, very condensed. So it's a little bit like you know, coal and um, geological formations. They are very, very intense carbon sequestered landscapes. Being on the bog was something I was very used to because our holding actually contained a little bit of bog at the bottom. Uh, we could easily enter it by just going down to a field called the bog field and going into the bog. So it was something we were so used to we never thought secondly about going to the bog. Well my father would be on the bog and we would be sent down from the kitchen with food to him at times. And uh, because it was so near the house he often came just up home. But the food going to the bog would be hard boiled eggs and bottles of milk and a tin of sugar and a little can of tea. There were always lots of frogs. Frogs were in profusion on the bogs and uh, mostly frogs really. I, I don't know that there were many other animals that I remember seeing but no doubt they were there and the animals were very shy, you see. The, the bog animals would have been shy. Hares, I remember hares quite a bit, yes. Well, there were larks and I know that when some, the men would be eating and they would throw down food, the sparrows would come for the food and uh, the cuckoo, of course, were in season and um, skylarks. And skylark nests were something wonderful to find because the skylark would run ahead of you to try and deflect you from her nest and when you saw her running, you knew it was somewhere nearby. Well, working on the bog was totally um, organised by the weather. It was all weather sensitive. So after a hard winter and maybe a wet spring, it would be a late season on the bog. But if it wasn't a too bad a winter and a dry spring, well then he'd start in early summer. And the cutting would take about two to three weeks. And after it was cut and put in little squares, and then put in small clamps, getting ready to bring it home. It would be um, left on the bog, but from anything from two to eight weeks it would take to dry it out. Well, we got to know several, well, we knew them already, I guess, several families, but they would always be there. And um, we knew the McKennas of Les Lynn, they were great men for the bog, and the Tullys of Les Lynn, and the Daltons of Mulla. And, um, you know, they were very friendly. There was a great camaraderie on the bog. The bog to us represented our winter's heat. And um, when, you, when the winter time would come and you had been on the bog and it was a good summer, you were guaranteed warmth all winter. And uh, in the autumn, you go out to the haggard and you would see a rick of hay, a rick of straw, and then a rick of turf. And there was a great satisfaction looking around you and seeing that. You knew the cattle were going to be looked after both for food and for their bedding and that we were going to be looked after with heat. And if you went a little bit further you might find a few bins of crushed oats and you knew yeah, everything's all right. Mulla Village supports the bog in lots of different ways. Um, in terms of the school, what happens with the school is the children are brought from the local um, primary school in Mulla and the teachers bring them down to the bog and show them the bog children and the next generation will know about the, the, that, the significance of this, this area in Mulla. There's also um, Mulla Heritage Trust and um, together with the Killiconny Bog Project we try and organise events out on the bog. Again to increase awareness of the bog, to protect it, to show that the many benefits of walking around the bog, seeing um, any of the flora and fauna. And one of the other things is that the Heritage Centre has a fantastic bog exhibition located there 
and so people can actually see diagrams of, of how the bog is formed. Because uh, sometimes it's hard to picture how a bog is formed when you see the layers of heather and the sphagnum moss on it. But when you see the, how deep the bog can be and you can see how long it took for that to form, you see how important it is to protect the bog because we can't get it to grow back overnight. The tools we have here now, them are the tools we have for cutting the turf. And there was special tools, there was different tools for different kind of people to cut the turf. There was left, left hand slains and right hand slains and a breast slain as well. That was a breast slain. That was used mostly on this bog over here, on the Kilakuni bog, that one there. Well, this here now, if you're cutting all day with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a slain, with a, with a, with a, with a hand like that in it, 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 your hand wouldn't be able to do it, so the, the, they come up with an idea that they, they'd get a horn of a bullock and they'd put it on the end of the slain and they'd have it there for smoothness. Yes. Well, you, you'd come to the bog at the end of February and you'd, you, you'd mark out your, your bank and you'd cut the heather off it and you'd have it ready and all when the good weather had come, you see. But there was a, a bit of thing getting ready, so you'd have, to, you'd have to come along and you'd have to get, a, get, get the side here first and cut the old heather off the bank. And you'd have to come in and you'd have to get this machine, this tool here, and you'd have to cut, cut it down like this to take it off the top of the bog because it was no use, it was, no, it was, uh, it was spongy. So you get that ready, and then you'll be ready in, in, in March, and then the March, then the, 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 you get cut on the turf. These were besoms and things was cut on the bog, so they cut them, and this one was here was used for a, a yard brush outside your house, so it was. And this one here was used for inside your house, that, that was the sweeping brush for the kitchen, that one there. That was the sweeping brush for the kitchen, and that was the, that was the heart brush for the fire. And that was the pot scrub, that one there. That was the pot scrub for scrubbing the, the old pot, so it was. And that brush there, that brush there, it was for spraying potatoes, so it was. That one was for spraying potatoes. And this one here, this was a whitewashing brush, a whitewashing the sheds here and all. That's what they had. And they cut all down the bogs, what they did. But they'd have to cut them nearly every year because they had to go bad on them, you know, it'd go hard and it'd be no use. They'd have to get a bucket and they put the blue stone in the bucket and they dip that in and they go like this, spraying the spuds. This is a little wing slain and it was used by a boy on gel on the bog. She'd be young, they'd be learning them how to, how, to, how to cut the turf and they'd spend the whole day tricking with that and they'd be very, very happy, so they would. And this is a, a slain that was got from the county Leitrim. It's a wing slain now. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a right hand one, that one. And the cow's horn is on the top of it for easy on your hands, what it is. And this is a, well, let's see now. Aye, this is a Leitrim slain, that one there. That one, there's a right hand left as well. And there's a, a mead one as well. That's, a, that's a, a mead one here. Mead slain as well. Yeah. And sure, they're all different kinds. And that was another one there. That was the grape where the trough would be dry and you'd be bringing it in, pegging it into the cart. You're pegging it in with, that, with, with an, old, an old grape like that into the, into the charts. One of our aims here at the Killicony Bog Project is to try and make this amenity accessible and inclusive to everybody living in the community and further afield. Um, some of the ideas we had were an accessible boardwalk um, that would lead out to an accessible classroom. The advantage of the boardwalk is where people with mobility issues or with a physical or sensory disability can gain access to the bog and experience the different bog and animal life that's available here at Killaconny. We also have a local artist who facilitates art classes here on the bog. Our proposed facility of an outdoor classroom would offer that opportunity for people with limited mobility or maybe who use a wheelchair to enjoy that resource. We as a group, we want to promote inclusion. We want to be proactive rather than reactive when we're talking about planning projects or developments here. It's about advocating on behalf of people with disabilities and explaining to our local authorities and government bodies when we're applying for funding to fund this resource. Um, we want to make this wonderful amenity an experience and a space that everybody can enjoy. There were many public rights, rights of way for tough cutters in the past to access Killaconny Bog. The first one was the old bog road on the Rand Tavern side and people would then exit by the Farta townland in this area. Another was off the present Leitrim Road in this townland. 
And then there was a third further access point from the Fagat side, which provided a way into the bog from people living in that area. We have seen clips in this film about the bog's connection to the past and how it has provided livelihoods to many and how it was the main source of energy available at the time to heat people's homes and for cooking. It was also a place where local people collaborated to help each other rearing turf and bringing home their turf. This is evident from the stories we have heard. It was a place which had a great sense of camaraderie, support and also some fun. Because we have moved away from turf cutting, the bog has a new importance and a new role for today's world. One being mental health and well-being. The outdoors has a proven track record in improving people's mood, reducing feelings of stress, helping people to take time out and feel more relaxed, improve your physical health, improve your confidence and self-esteem and help you get more active. It's also a place where you can get to know more people socially, connect to your local community. Bogs are an excellent facility for walking and getting physical exercise with the benefit of experiencing a unique environment that has wonderful smells, sounds and many different colours that you won't experience with other outdoor activities. <laughs>